Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, veterans and coaches and family and friends, whoever we have tuning in today. You have myself, Coach Jesse Martin and Coach Rebecca Hatley here to talk to you about PTSD. Before we jump into it, we would love for you guys to post in the comments where you're coming to us from today and where what what branches and what years you served. We look forward to seeing all that information. I myself am an Army veteran of 21 and a half years. I did three tours in Iraq, two in Afghanistan, recently retired earlier this year from the Army as a first sergeant and uh, loved giving beans and bullets to soldiers while I was in and now I give beans and bullets to veterans. Uh, getting to continue service and uh, serving this veteran family. I'll let Coach Rebecca jump on here and introduce herself as well. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, good morning. Hello, everybody, welcome. We're super glad you're here. Um, throw a comment in the chat, let us know where you're from and everything um, so we can say hello. Um, I'm Rebecca, I am a veteran coach here, been here at VACI um, since March, February, March, and uh, loving, just loving the job, loving getting to talk to veterans every day. Um, I myself am not a veteran actually. Um, I do come from a family with a long military service history though. Um, and also my boyfriend is currently in the med board process, um, leaving the army. And so um, certainly, you know, surrounded, surrounded by veterans and um, glad to have the opportunity to serve on all of you in this way with this role. So, hey, Tracy, US Army. Biloxi, Mississippi, Tracy. I thought you were gonna say Navy there for a second, being down there in Mississippi. Um, know a lot of sailors from down there. Looks like we got a, got a good group of, of Marine Corps, Army, and I'm not seeing much else today. Maybe we have some sailors in here or some airmen or some coasties. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, so today our, our topic's uh, PTSD, the three different types of PTSD recognized by the VA. Um, Rebecca and I are kind of just doing an overview, uh, save your questions to the end. Uh, we'd love to answer all the questions. Uh, that's one of the biggest reasons I love giving classes and doing these lives are, is to answer questions. Oh, Justin Conway, I've got to pick on you being from Arkansas, man. That's where I grew up. Hopefully it's not too hot and too humid for you down there right now. Um, your name sounds familiar to you, to me though. We might know each other, um, but you know what they say, we're all related down there. Um, <laughs> So three types of PTSD. We got combat, 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 combat. And then we also have non-combat um, and MST. You know, all three very, very different types of post-traumatic stress. Uh, so, you know, we all ask ourselves, what is PTSD? What is it? What is it? Rebecca, would you like to chime in and share what your thoughts are on what PTSD is and what the uh, American Psych Psychiatric Association says PTSD is? Yeah, so uh, PTSD, of course, stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, according to the American Psychiatric Association, um, it's a disorder that may be uh, may occur in people who have experienced or witnessed a traumatic event, such as serious accident, terrorist act, war or combat, or those who have been threatened with death, sexual violence, or serious injury. So um, you can end up having a diagnosis of PTSD as a result of your time in service if you have witnessed um, or experienced a traumatic event. And so that's what we'll talk about today. Um, and as Jesse was talking about, there's those three different um, classifications, if you will. And so we'll dive a little bit further into those to um, give you hopefully some good information just about um, about each of these and help to get you thinking about um, how that might apply to you and your claim journey as well. So, um, you know, in VA speak, in VA terms, um, the event which you experienced is called a stressor event. Um, and one of the really important things to remember about PTSD claims is that you uh, can't claim PTSD without that stressor event. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Jesse, do you have any? Well, you know, the thing I love about these lives is Rebecca, we can talk about and jump around how, however we want to. While she's mentioning those, those stressor events, you know, um, 
we veterans are always under a stigmata that, man, we, we, we had to go to Iraq or Vietnam or Afghanistan or whatever battle conflict your generation may have been in to be diagnosed with PTSD. That's false. That's false. My mother has never served in the military. She's been diagnosed with PTSD because of non-combat type of actions. Um, you don't have to serve in the military to, to get diagnosed with PTSD. But some of your examples of in-service stre stressors could be an exposure to a death. So maybe you were in a unit that never deployed or on a ship or in an air wing that never deployed and you had a uh, fellow service member commit suicide that you were close to. That could be a great example of a trigger event for you. Um, maybe you were threatened, your life was threatened in some shape, form, or fashion while serving. Or you had a serious injury or a serious injury was threatened upon you or acts of sexual violence or threat of sexual violence. Those are some examples, prime examples of in-service stressors. And you notice, you know, all of those can happen in a in a deployed theater or in a wartime, I mean, a peacetime garrison situation. So, you know, get that stigmata out of your head that you have to deploy to have PTSD because you're wrong and you're still drinking the Kool-Aid that the military was given to you. Right. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think it's super important to talk about the non-combat stressors um, because I think it's actually a more common claim than the combat PTSD claims. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people think, well, oh, you know, I would have had to had a combat situation to claim PTSD and it's just not true. You know, the VA is recognizing non-combat um, as well as the PTSD from MST and MST is military sexual trauma. So um, they also recognize that as a classification um, of a stressor. So uh, yeah, definitely important conversation to talk about the differences there um, because I think it, um, it, you know, it makes a lot of people realize, you know, oh, like maybe, maybe what I experienced is valid and you know, what I am going through. Um, you know, it might be PTSD and being able to um, have that permission almost to um, go, you know, see someone about that and, um, you know, start to work through and maybe make a claim. Um, it's super important. Uh, I agree with you, Rebecca. And I kind of went off your script. So we'll, we'll get back a little okay. bit on your script that you gave me because uh, I'm all over the place. <laughs> um, I saw Brian's name pipe pop up. So that always makes me a little nervous too. Hey boss, <laughs> hope you're having a great day out there. Um, so let's, let's talk about PTSD com combat first. PTSD combat first. Um, you know, you guys heard me. I did three tours in Iraq, two in Afghanistan. And I will tell you not every deployment for me had a PTSD stressor event in it. Five, four of the five did, but one of them did not. Um, so just because you deployed you may have an, a stressor event. You may not have a stressor event. Some of the key stressor events to think about from a combat standpoint would be rocket attacks. You know, a lot of us do go over there and support the mission uh, and never have to leave the FOB, never go out, drive a truck down a grenade alley, as we often call them sometimes, or IED alley. And uh, you don't have to do that. So, you know, for those that stay on the, the FOBs over there, you know, rocket attacks, were there any ambushes, uh, IED events, uh, flight deck plane crash for those sailors out there, uh, shipboard, um, you know, I don't know if shipboard firefighting would count, but, you know, if you were deployed to the Persian Gulf, maybe a fire on the ship uh, could count as combat. Um, Seeing another service member killed, obviously, is a big one. Um, those are just a few examples of combat-related PTSD stressors. Uh, there's hundreds of them, um, you know, for those, I like to touch base, touch specifically on those that don't leave the fobs and bases very much when they're deployed. You know, you don't have to see that direct action to have that combat stressor event. Um, maybe you're an administrative guy in your unit and you have to process all of the, the casualty reports that come in from the front line. You know, that, that's a significant event. My last my last deployment, I was on a general staff and I was a casualty operations um, boss for the entire country of Iraq. And I, I was thrilled about the job because I wasn't in a frontline unit. I said, man, this is going to be an easy job. I can just process these. 
these um, these casualty reports and I'm not going to know anyone. And the very first casualty report I got was someone from my previous unit that I knew. And that was a, a big stressor event for me in, into that deployment. While I wasn't out in the front lines, I was still dealing with the front line issues from, from the rear. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to identifying those stressors that are combat related, sometimes you really got to sit down and think about your deployment, depending on what type of job you had. Um, Rebecca, you want to chime in with anything on there? Um, I think it's just a really good point to bring up um, as far as like maybe one of the myths or, um, you know, things veterans convince themselves of when it comes to the PTS, uh, PTSD claims is that um, you often think about having to have direct engagement um, in order to have PTSD or to claim PTSD. And as you're saying, um, you know, that's not that's not true. There is that other path um, where maybe, you know, you've you just have that exposure to what's happening on the front lines and it makes a big impact. So um, I'm glad you brought that up, that difference there. Yeah, I love debunking myths and beliefs and helping our, our, our family out here. Um, most people call it a veteran community. I call it a veteran family because I don't care when or where or what branch you served with. We all choose the same dirt somehow. Somehow we all did. And, uh, you know, you guys are in the right place. So let, let's move on to uh, non-combat. Non-combat. I'll let Rebecca take this one a little, a little further. Um, you know, go push her out of her comfort zone. You guys be nice to her. Today's her first live. So be nice yeah, it's to my her. first Facebook live, everyone. <laughs> I'm glad be, to be here, though. Be so, nice to her. Yeah. I got to meet her, meet her back in June when we were in Gettysburg, and she and I had a couple great conversations out there. She's uh, actually out in my old stomping grounds when I was stationed at Fort Lewis, and you know, I'm very familiar with she, where she's at. So I'll go let her take non-combat stressors and talk about those and I'll jump in and throw my two cents in where I can. Cool. Sounds good. So um, like we were saying, the non-combat uh, PTSD is actually a, quite often a more common claim um, than the combat PTSD. And um, so that's an active duty stress event that has occurred outside of a combat deployment. So if you think about um, like if a unit has activated in response to a natural disaster, um, maybe there was some kind of accident or crash while you were in training um, in which a service member was injured or maybe you were injured. Um, maybe if a fellow service member committed suicide um, in the dorms or if you witnessed an assault or a rape on another service member, um, those all count as non-combat stressors. And in the same way that there's many stressors that are related to combat, there's many, many that are related to non-combat as well. So um, like Jesse was saying, you know, it might take uh, it might take some time to just, you know, think about your time in service and um, being able to identify all those. Um, in one thing to touch on with PTSD claims is that um, you have to be able to prove the stressor event. And so there's some ways that you can do that, um, whether you're talking about combat, non-combat, or MST. Um, the VA is looking for proof of that stressor event. And um, so one of those ways is a buddy letter can help verify and uh, validate that you were there, uh, witnessed the event, and um, have you know had effects since then. So um, Jesse, do you have any tips about any of the stressor proof? You know, I'll, evidence of a stressor event is is, is difficult sometimes. Um, there's several different ways about going to support your actual stressor event uh, when it comes to non-combat. Uh, for example, maybe training accidents or witnessing a rape, you know, possibly be able to go and get a copy from of the evidence or the report from the local um, provost marshal on the installation you're at for training accidents, maybe reach out to that training unit, training room that would have done the incident report with the unit. Um, but your lay and buddy statements are pretty, pretty powerful tool to use as evidence because it's first, first, um, first person witness from those that were there that witnessed the event along with you. So kind of doing, doing favors for both. You're helping them with their claim and you're helping them with yours. Uh, so, you know, remembering the 
the uh, situation and remembering who was there will help you get, gather the evidence that you need for your stress-free events uh, when it comes to getting those buddy statements. Um, it's, it's tough. You know, we all don't like, we all try to forget those traumatic events. And uh, I know I do. Um, we try to forget them after they happen. You know, we have to live with them and suck it up for a few days, but we try to forget them. But, you know, you really have to sit down and, and create an outline and identify the best date time group that you can so you can can reach out to the provost marshals unit uh, record offices wherever you need to to get that that evidence you need yeah um going further just into the non-combat ptsd as well we mentioned mst which is military sexual trauma and a somewhat sobering statistic on that, um, it's actually the incidents reported are actually up 1% uh, from the previous year. Um, the 2020 DOD report, annual report on sexual assault uh, was published in May and it showed 7,825 reported incidents um, at that point in the year. And so that's a really prevalent issue. And um, I think it's one of the lesser talked about, um, you know, events for uh, PTSD. And so it's important to touch on that as well, that the VA does actually define MST. And it comes from, you know, Title 38 um, in the U.S. Code. And it's defined as psychological trauma, which in the judgment of a VA mental health professional resulted from a physical assault of a sexual nature battery of a sexual nature or sexual harassment, which occurred while the veteran was serving on active duty, active duty for training or inactive duty training. So um, another, I think one of the common misconceptions is that MST um, means rape, but it also means um, assault and battery and harassment. Um, and so when you're, you know, if you've been wondering, thinking about, you know, whether um, an incident from your active duty would classify, I guess you could say, um, as, as claimable under the MST PTSD. Um, those are, you know, those are the guidelines that the, the VA has set forth um, for that. So um, again, it's one, it's one where they do have to prove the stressor event, um, but there's actually a different set of regulations there for uh, what they're looking for as evidence. So um, the reason for that is that you know, oftentimes those incidents aren't reported. They especially aren't reported usually right after they happen. Um, there's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, but the VA recognizes that it's a really difficult subject um, and it's really difficult to report as well. And so um, some of the, the markers that the VA looks at um, can, can serve as proof um, to an MST event. And so um, if you think sort of outside the box of whether or not maybe you um, maybe you requested to transfer units um, at some point after that event, or um, maybe you have a report um, of your work performance where it shows a huge drop off in your um, focus or your ability to complete your job, um, that can serve as proof as well. And oftentimes a sworn statement will uh, serve as enough proof for the VA as of a of an MST situation. So um, that's another that's another category um, of the of the non combat PTSD claims. And for you know for you more recently separated veterans that served in the military the last ten to fifteen years, if you really think about some of the tr new training that were introduced that was introduced to us um, semi annually, sometimes annually, uh, for those that served in the army, if you really remember, there was a big push for the SHARP program, which stood for sexual Har harassment, assault, and rape prevention program. Um, so, if you guys think about those programs and that remedial training that most of us just rolled our eyes at because we had to do it every year, and we're like, oh, not in my unit, not in, not in my ranks, and you know those were good those were put in place to help individuals identify sexual assault sexual harassment uh, because you know what may have came off as jokingly playing could have been harassment or assault um, so think back to your sharp classes that you had while you're in and if something 
fits the bill for MST because it didn't fit into that box of what Sharp was trying to prevent, you probably have a pretty good valid MST claim. Um, so just really think about it. Um, sorry for those that didn't get the Sharp training. It was very educational while, while we were in. Um, great, great program, great program. So Rebecca, what do, what do I need as evidence if I want to go after something like this? What, what do I need? <laughs> well, so um, just, I think we just, touched just, on just, just in general on, on PTSD because, you know, they're so similar in, in what you would need. What do, in general, what do I need for PTSD? So um, as we were talking about, you need that proof of stress or event. And so um, just real quickly to further describe what a stress or event is, um, think about exposure to death, threat of death actual or threatened serious injury, actual or threatened sexual violence. Um, so if you're kind of thinking about a situation and you're wondering if the stressor event is strong enough, you can ask yourself, you know, did I fear for my life in this situation? A pretty yes or no question, good gauge for um, figuring out if your stressor is going to be uh, strong enough for the VA to recognize. So, um, also, you need a diagnosis of PTSD. That's a super important one. We're talking about uh, stressor events and PTSD, but you know that does require going to see someone in order to get that diagnosis of PTSD. So if you have um, some symptoms that you've been dealing with and you're wondering kind of in the back of your head if uh, PTSD might be what you're experiencing, definitely go see someone. Um, you do need that diagnosis. And also, um, hopefully that can also lead to treatment, which is um, always going to be a healthy option um, to, to move forward. So um, let's see. What else? What am I missing? <laughs> I think I'm missing then, something. Then your statement for your stress for event. Yes, your statement. Your Do you statement. want to touch on sworn statements? Uh, we, we can touch on, touch on sworn statements a little bit if you want to. Um, I'll, you brought it up, so I'll let you take that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I think I mentioned it as um, one that is good for um, MST claims um, because, again, oftentimes there's not a lot of proof of those uh, situations happening. So um, sworn statements, too. So if even talking about, I believe, if you're talking about <clears throat> uh, another situation um, where there's just not a lot of documentation of the event that happened. If you have um, the ability to write a sworn statement um, that you were there and that happened to you and then also bring in a buddy letter, um, if you have that firsthand witness to confirm um, that, you know, they saw you there, maybe it also happened to them um, and they can write out some of those details. Uh, those are gonna be really strong statements to include with your claim. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I, hey guys, I was excited to do this with Re Rebecca today. I know she's a, she's a very analytical person and I actually learned something from her yesterday when we were preparing for this. Um, I wanted to share it with you guys, which many of you probably know it, but I'm not, you know, I don't dive into the weed, weeds more than I have to sometimes. And, um, she put on this little outline she made that service members have been found to have be four times more likely to develop PTSD. So what that means is, you know, just because you serve, you're four times more likely to develop some form of PTSD, whether it's combat, non-combat, MST, um, over our civilian counterparts that never serve. So, you know, the military, whether it doesn't matter what, form, shape, capacity you served in is tough on our mental health. We we see things that the general public don't see. And that's that starts in basic training. And uh, you know, that pushes us to have these greater increased risk of developing PTSD and other mental health conditions. Um, Kind of, if Rebecca doesn't have anything else, I'd kind of like to open it up to questions. I see one that I want to answer before uh, we let everyone else start flooding it with questions. Um, this is to address Philip's question. How soon can I start requesting VA disability rating? 
Uh, depending on your situation, Philip, you can file for a disability rating prior to getting out of the service, um, or you can file day one out of service. It just depends on what your situation is, sir. Um, there are several different options you, you have in front of you right now. Then Aaron, behind the scenes, Aaron is going to post uh, the link to the elite membership for you guys that are interested in signing up. And we're ready for your questions. I would disappear yeah. and give them all to Rebecca. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. There's been quite a few posts here in the chat. Um, definitely, you know, if at the end of this you still have lingering questions and we weren't able to address everything, um, you know, check out that sign up. Is the VA respecting telediagnosis for claims? Um, Jeff is asking this. Um, Jeff, yes. So um, telehealth appointments um, are medical appointments and you have a board certified doctor who is completing that visit. Um, and if you're talking specifically about mental health claims, um, if you see a board certified psychologist who's able to um, give you a diagnosis or maybe confirm a diagnosis, um, that is acceptable medical evidence to the VA. I, I would I would hope so, Jeff, because, you know, they did a telehealth appointment with me yesterday and I, I don't think it'd be fair for them to uh, do a telehealth appointment with me and, and not accept a veteran's claim on a telehealth appointment. Yeah, they're still doing a lot of CNP exams, telehealth as well. But we're still seeing, you know, telehealth claims, uh, diagnosis and stuff at this time are still being submitted, uh, accepted by the VA. All right, Chris, so how does it work with a PTSD claim? Do we have to see and talk to a VA doctor for the claim? Those guys are always, are all in to get people denied. Chris, no, you don't have to see a VA doctor for PTSD claim. You, your diagnosis can come from a private healthcare provider. Um, it doesn't matter where that diagnosis comes from as long as it's service connected. Um, you'll be able to file your claim with that diagnosis. Um, you will have to see a contract provider for your CMP exam that's contracted through the VA for your CMP exam for your PTSD, but you don't have to see a, a VA doctor for the PTSD diagnosis. I got some for PTSD and the VA says I don't qualify for unemployability. So um, I think there's kind of multiple facets to this. So unemployability, um, there's temporary unemployability, which um, is TDIU, where you can be uh, paid at 100% for the unemployability. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Jesse, it, it's 60% correct overall um, for TDIU. Do you know? Yeah, 60% is the number, 60% on one rating. Yeah. So um, for that one, I mean, if that's, I'm not sure how that came about, you know, when you got your 70% for PTSD and they're saying you don't qualify for unemployability. Um, I don't know if that was something that you were made aware of after a duty to assist situation where the VA um, made you aware of unemployability. Um, I'm not sure if you interpret that different. So Dwayne, you know, Unemployability sometimes is all based off of your signs, symptoms that you're having. Um, it could have been that your PTSD is rated at 70%, but you're not at that unemployability um, status yet. Um, if you feel that you are there, keep, keep trying, keep trying. Thanks also coach Jonathan. He's hitting a lot of questions here in the chat. Appreciate that. Yeah. All right. U.S. Marine Corps Farrell. I was in during desert storm, but did not see combat. We did lose 11 guys in our unit for the last five to six months. I've been thinking about these Marines and I just break down and cry. And I'm not sure if this would fall under PTSD. Um, while I'm not a mental health professional, I would say you should talk to a mental health professional about that. Um, 
you know, there's a lot of different thoughts that come to my mind when, when I read, read your statement here, uh, Mr. Farrell. Um, you know, the biggest one that comes to mind when I read it, survivor's guilt, which I, I struggle with very much. So, um, I would recommend that you talk to a mental health professional because you, you may have, you may have PTSD. Um, I would highly recommend talking to a mental health professional. I saw a question in the chat here as well, um, touching on having two diagnoses, um, PTSD and depression. Um, trying to find the question here. I think the question was if those would be given separate ratings um, or if they would be combined. So that's actually a really good question because um, all mental health conditions are rated under the same uh, diagnostic criteria. So whether you have a, a, you know, PTSD diagnosis or depression, or maybe you have PTSD and anxiety, um, maybe you have multiple diagnoses, those um, all fall under the same criteria and they will rate you for one of them. Um, you may see it listed on your e-benefits that you're rated for PTSD, maybe at 70%, and then also see that you have anxiety. Yeah, you'll sometimes have a little drop down that goes to anxiety or they'll they'll lump it together in one overall rating. The issue with mental health conditions is the signs and symptoms of them are so very similar to each other that it's hard to distinguish between PTSD and uh, anxiety disorder and MDD. Um, and that's the reason why the VA does it the way they do. Oh, yes, Donna. She said it was her who asked. Thanks. Let's see here. Facebook user, do you think that one annotation in my medical records about me seeing a crisis counselor for September 11th is enough evidence to file a non-combat PTSD claim? Um, I think that it's a good start. Uh, one thing to remember about PTSD claims or mental health claims in general is that um, you do need to provide evidence of your ongoing um, symptoms severity of symptoms. Um, so, you know, maybe thinking about getting an additional independent medical opinion to help show the diagnosis of PTSD and um, the severity of your symptoms. Um, and then also including that, that record of seeing a crisis counselor um, can help to strengthen your claim. So to, to caveat off of what Rebecca said, I'll just share, share my example uh, with you guys. I had one documented trip to a mental health professional while I was serving. I was under the stigmata that if I showed weakness in my behavioral health, I was going to lose my career and be washed out of the army. And um, I did a lot of out of pocket spending on treatment and, and counseling and stuff like that because I didn't want it in my military records. And uh, that doctor's office that I was going to had closed several years ago. And when I retired this year, all I had as evidence was that diagnosis, that one counseling appointment many, many years ago. And I was able to complete the process. So as long as you're able to talk to your signs and symptoms and there's a diagnosis in there, it's like Rebecca said, it's a great start. Awesome. Okay. How do you define sexual harassment? Oh, I know Jonathan posted that in there. Yeah. So thanks, Coach Jonathan. We appreciate you. Section 1561 of Title 10, United States Code defines sexual harassment as conduct that involves unwanted sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and deliberate or repeated offensive comments or gestures of a sexual nature. So that is how it's defined, Tracy. Um, no, lots of room left to open, not lots of room to uh, interpret there pretty cut and dry on what the title tens definition is. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you were just being harassed in a, in a different way. If you don't feel it meets that definition. 
Randy is asking, what if they have kept the incident a secret for a long time and there's no big event uh, talked about it? Well, so, Randy, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, Randy, does, did anyone else witness the event? Does anyone else know about it? That would be my first question for you, sir. Uh, is there anyone that could provide a lay statement for you, a buddy statement? And, um, you know, who knows about the event? Is it going to turn into a he said, he see, he, sh he said, she said, or was there actual witnesses to the event as well? Um, very vague question, Randy, but, uh, you know, one of the coaches in the chat may be able to provide a little more detail to you, or you, you could, uh, wake up with one of us and uh, sign up for elite service and we can dive even further into that question for you. Yeah, I was going to say that's actually a pretty big question. And I think we touched on how, especially with um, MST situations, you know, those often aren't reported and they are kept secret for a very long time. Um, and there's many reasons for that. So, um, you know, we don't, we don't want to say that you don't have a claim. Um, it would be really beneficial to sign up and talk to a coach a little bit further about that to talk about, um, you know, what what type of evidence could be built um, to help support a claim for PTSD. And as, as Brian says, boom, there it is, a 30-minute free <laughs> consultation. <laughs> your, your call today. Uh, we, we love talking with the veterans, whether, you know, all veterans. I love talking to all veterans um, on the street at home in this this forum it doesn't matter i just love talking to family and uh you know these free 30 minute strategy sessions are awesome you know it's really a great time to learn more about you guys as individuals and and learn more about the process that we do here at va claims insider and see if we're right fits for each other yeah. Also, I wanted to mention as well, we've talked a lot about, you know, evidence in the form of buddy letters and everything like that. Um, you know, if you do sign up for our elite program, we have um, templates that you can use to help to write those statements. Um, and so there's a lot of resources that are going to be available to you if you sign up um, to help to get all this evidence together for your claim. And you'll also get a coach who is you know wanting to help you be successful so they'll give you further recommendations and um, help to review everything and you know make sure that you're putting all the right evidence forward to start with with your claim right if i have service connection and rated for panic disorder without agoraphobia can i file for ptsd or will the VA only uh, award, award only one mental health condition? Um, so that goes back to, they'll rate you for one mental health condition, um, but you can have it listed the multiple diagnoses of uh, panic disorder, PTSD. Um, so if you already have a service connection for a mental health uh, diagnosis, you would be looking at um, maybe filing an increase and proving if your symptoms have gotten worse. And I think it's important to note that your diagnosis is somewhat fluid in that. Again, they're rating your symptoms off of the same criteria for any diagnosis. So um, if, say, you know, say a diagnosis of PTSD, your symptoms are much stronger um, and you're experiencing a lot them a lot more frequently, um, you'd still be seeking an increase on that mental health rating, and it's possible that your diagnosis could actually change as what is the rated percentage. Roman, when it comes comes down to mental health claims, um, at the end of the day, it's about your signs and symptoms and how, how it affects you socially and occupationally. Um, what it's categorized as, whether it's PTSD, um, bipolarism, or GAD, or MDD, it, it doesn't matter. It, it's it's more so about your signs and symptoms and how it affects you socially and occupationally. Awesome. A shout out from Felix here before this other question. He said, thanks for all the advice provided. I went up from 30% to 70% service connection for anxiety and finally for 100% uh, 100 PNT. That's awesome. Good Excellent. job, Felix. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. We like to celebrate those. <laughs> yes, we do. OK. 
Okay, it looks like another question posted here. Um, how successful is a 100% uh, TNP or PNT disability for PTSD for MST? I'm at 50% now. No, you know, uh, Facebook user, I'm sorry to address you that way, but uh, that's how it's, sh it's showing up for us. It, it's really hard to say. That's that's another one that I would, I'd have to say, sign up, do the free strategy call, or sign up for the elite service and talk with the coach. Um, during that strategy call, um, you know, you'll have 30 minutes to identify some of your signs and symptoms and, and discuss your, your severity of your case. And maybe it does warrant a 100% rating, maybe it doesn't. But, you know, this form that we're currently in, it's really hard to discuss because it's so much uh, personal data. And we, we don't we don't want anyone to share their personal data here. Sandra asks, I have a 50% rating right now, but I'm afraid to pursue 100% due to the possibility of losing or having my 50% lowered. Is this a valid concern? How often does this occur? Have you seen this much, Jesse, with? Sandra, I've, I've been with VA Claims Insider since January this, January this year, and I haven't seen any of the veterans that I've worked with get lowered ratings uh, for pursuing a higher rating. Um, I wish I had some analytical number for you percentage wise that I could share with you, but I don't. Um, I would say as long as long as the increase is warranted and you have the signs and symptoms of whatever condition you're going to increase or you're claiming in the diagnosis and the evidence, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about it too much. So, Justin, are you this the diagnosis from the VA? Um, would it go from your diagnosis date or your intent to file date? Typically, it goes from your diagnosis date, Justin. Um, yeah, it, if you've had an intent to file that's 11 months old and you got diagnosed today and submit your evidence today and your diagnosis is for today, it's going to be based off of your diagnosis date, not your intent to file date. Are they slowing down? Are the questions slowing down? I hope not. We still got about uh, 17 minutes. There we go. Can you request a certain coach, male or female, or one that has already gone through what you are trying to claim? Uh, that's a great question, actually. So um, you can request a uh, male or female coach. Um, you know, initially, if you get paired, say, with a male coach, and you're really not comfortable discussing um, your claim with them, you can request a coach transfer. Um, I think all of us here, uh, Jesse and I were actually discussing this the other day. I think all of us coaches here are really respectful of that. And, you know, we're not going to be offended if you would like to switch coaches for that reason. We completely understand sometimes it's easier to talk to uh, one coach, you know, a female coach over a male coach or vice versa. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers the question. Starting my claim after my discharge in the Gulf War, I've been diagnosed with PTSD by the VA and my private doctor, but I can't locate her because her office is closed. Are my VA records enough? Ms. Lopez, do your VA records service connected for you? That would be my first question. If, if your diagnosis by the VA provides a service connection saying it was caused by this trigger event while you were in the Gulf War, yes, that will be enough. If it's just a general diagnosis of PTSD with no service connection, it will not be enough, sir. <laughs> Tracy, I wished, I wish their mental harassment I think I, I endured that for 21 years every time they changed the policy on me. Um, I th think that would fall in line with your PTSD claim now.
that's a good uh, good point also with the when with any MST claims um, you're not actually claiming MST you're claiming PTSD as a result of MST and so it definitely falls under a category of stressor um, but you're not actually claiming the MST you're claiming PTSD non-combat PTSD is there a max limit on percentage the max limit on percentage is 100% no. Mr. Goldman, it's all, all about your signs and symptoms and your social and occupational impairments. Um, that's that's for all mental health ratings. Um, just how does it how does it affect you, sir? You know, and I'm not asking you to share here, but you know, it's the signs and symptoms and how it affects you socially and occupationally that ter determines your rating with the VA. How do you file an increase on your rating without waiting decades? <laughs> Excellent question. <laughs> Can take some time, but um, filing an increase, um, that's again, a good opportunity to connect with a coach because um, they're gonna have some pretty straightforward steps to streamline you towards that increase. Um, what's the average, Jesse, what's the average time you've been seeing uh, returns on your claim decisions? Oh, for, for increases, I've been seeing increases turn around in eight days to four and a half, five weeks. Uh, I would say four and a half, five weeks is about the average I'm seeing for a, a simple increase right now. Um, depends on the condition and, you know, every every veteran, every claim is a little different. Um, but they can go really quick sometimes and often, often increases are some of the easiest um, claims to go after. Right, already service connected, um, and so you're not having to uh, prove, you know, prove that service connection. But you don't have to wait decades. Please don't wait decades. Right, <laughs> please don't. The longer you wait, the more difficult it becomes. How far back can you go for your medical records? Oh, that's a question I hate. So I'm going to throw that one at Rebecca all day long. <laughs> I hate anything record wise. Oh boy. <laughs> so uh, medical records. I don't know if you're asking specifically about the VA medical records. Um, so far, how far back can you go for your medical records? Um, I mean, in theory, you're supposed to be able to request your in-service records um, and any medical records that you have been seen for through the VA since. Um, private medical records is a little bit different story there. Um, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know the specifics on like how long records are kept for private records, um, but I know that the VA records, you're, you know, you should be able to download those. I'd say Jesse, exhaust all efforts you you can to find all the records you can. Uh, over the years, the record keeping in the military and for the VA have gotten better, but you know that's with advances in technologies and the way they record keep. So, even for myself, uh, serving from ninety nine to twenty twenty one, there was a lot of records missing from deployments because the the um, main military treatment facilities in garrison were were um, digitally based and everything we did downrange were uh, paper files so you know it's it's tough it's that's one of the toughest questions veterans can ask us is about records because yeah. there, there there is no correct answer to it there is no correct answer all right i think we have one more question here Nori is asking, I'm not sure if this has been asked, but I do not have any proof of MST because I did not report it. Can I still file it? So yes, um, and that's a good one to get with a coach because there's probably some additional specifics to go over there. Um, but as we mentioned, there are different forms of proof of an MST stressor. Um, and so you know, whether that's a report from a job performance or um, someone who knows you who has seen how um, how that has affected you over time um, to write a buddy letter. There's a few different ways that you can still file your claim and provide uh, evidence as well. It's about that time, guys, we're going to start wrapping up. And if you look down below right now, you can see the link to the elite membership uh, Get started today for free. 
Uh, if you're not ready to commit to that level, Miss Erin will throw up the free consultation next and you can sign up and get a free 30 minute uh, discovery call today. A free 30 minute strategy session with one of the coaches are, are on what would look right for you guys and find out if we're a good fit for you and find out if you're a good fit for us. Um, you know, these Facebook lives, I always love doing them. Um, I love the comments. I love being put on spot because I'm such a big old introvert and live in the middle of nowhere in the mountains. So all I have to do is talk to animals, but I love, I love this community. I love what we're doing. And uh, I hope that some of you that are on the fence right now, sign up for that 30 minute discovery session today, or go ahead and sign up for the elite service. Cause Rebecca and I would love to work with you. And Absolutely. That, goes for, that goes for all the other coaches here at VA Claims Insider as well. Yeah. We're super glad you joined us today. Um, and we'll see you around. Yes. Have a great day.